Speaking of trouble, we've been talking about sin while you were gone. All right, well, we better get preaching or you guys will be here all day and I know how you'd like that. So um, anyway, um, this is the third message in a series. The other two are on YouTube. If you've missed them, you're not going to be too far behind. It's a fairly familiar story for most people, but if, if it's not, oh, I'll fill you in on some of the details. But part of good parenting is providing discipline. Good parenting includes helping your kids know the difference between right and wrong and taking care of those sorts of things. And I started to wonder, <clears throat> excuse me, what kind of unusual punishments are out there? And I will just warn you right now, if you Google that, be careful. <clears throat> but I started to wonder, you know, what are some of the more unusual punishments that, that are out there? I wondered if you missed this ad from back in 2008. This made national headlines when a mom put this ad in the newspaper in Iowa. Old's 1999 intrigue, totally uncool parents who, don't, who obviously don't love their teenage son selling his car. Only driven for three weeks before Snoopy mom who needs to get a life found booze under the front seat. $3,700 or best offer. <laughs> Call the meanest mom on the planet. <laughs> Kid claimed it wasn't his. Somebody put it in there and she said, well, you knew the rules, so it was either yours or you didn't lock the car door. So <laughs> either way, um, you broke two of the rules that were supposed to be. It's a new kind of discipline method out there, and I think this became very popular with the advent of social media, but they call it humiliation punishments or humiliation discipline. And basically, it's for kids who don't get good grades because they're just not good at it. Um, so they have this kid wearing his sign. It says, my grades, algebra. I'm not sure what E means, to be honest. Um, is that almost an F? D, E, uh, I don't know. I would think excellent too, but you know, if science is his worst, worst grade, that's kind of a, a, a severe punishment. But uh, the idea being that, you know, this is something that if you're not going to put the effort in, uh, I tell my kids all the time, if you're just stupid, I'm not going to be upset that your grades are bad. <laughs> Problem is, you're just not doing the work. And so anyway, I don't know what his story is. Um, this child, who's obviously crying and whose full face isn't shown, basically says she was holding liquor and obviously she's not ready for social media. I'm sure that's what her mom wrote. So uh, basically says, don't look for me on Facebook. Bye-bye, sad face. Um, humiliation, punishment. Do you remember this guy? I can't remember how far back this goes. It's not that far back, but this is him, a, a screenshot of him on a YouTube video. Um, reading something that his daughter wrote about how horrible his parents were and how they asked him to ask her to bring them coffee and that's what they have a housekeeper for or something like that. I don't remember all the details and he was posting this stuff on Facebook and all that. So he reads the letter and afterwards he takes out a revolver and shoots the computer six times. <laughs> made the national news. I remember seeing it and, and kind of the gist of, of some of the comments that people make when this is found posted online is, well, he really only punished himself because we're sure he paid for the computer and not the kid. And I thought, well, you know, I don't think shooting the computer was the punishment, but knowing everyone who knows you has seen this, probably the worst punishment you could ever have. <laughs> that's my dad. That's my computer. <laughs> How about this one? Want a free babysitter for a night out? Doesn't look like it's really that, like she's just trying to be nice, right? Well, turns out that her parents heard some noises upstairs, went upstairs and she was having a party. 
So they needed some sort of a consequence for her, so they decided to sentence her to 30 hours of free babysitting, and in order to help her with that task, they took out an ad in the local newspaper. <laughs> I think the bottom part of that goes on to explain why she's doing this. Reality is, is that disobedience demands a response. If our job is to raise our children to be the, the very best that they can be and hopefully to also be godly children, then when things aren't going quite the way they ought to be, there's, there's a response from us that is demanded. Now, I don't know about making your kid wear a sign, taking pictures of it and putting it all over Facebook or whatever else. I mean, you can kind of figure that out. But the reality is, is that there needs to be some sort of a response. But I'm also convinced that our response must be a loving response. That whatever discipline that we choose to use on our kids is a very loving discipline. I'm sure my kids will tell you, I do nothing but love. <laughs> that sounded really convincing. You won't get your five dollars. <laughs> Been looking at... Adam and Eve and the, the doctrine of sin. And one of the things that I've been trying to really kind of say is, look, the Adam and Eve story is fairly, fairly familiar for most people. Adam and Eve, the first humans, told to eat anything but from one tree, and they go eat from the one tree. And so they have separated themselves from God. And it's important, I said a couple weeks ago, for us to pay attention or temptation to sin is going to deceive you. The whole problem that begins with Adam and Eve is that little bit of deception that turns into, well, can I believe God or do I believe the serpent? And so we've got to pay attention to what we think or what we know or, or be aware that there is, there is a sin that's trying to keep us from being the people that God wants us to be and, and being with him. We talked a little bit last week about overcoming the bondage to shame and the desire to cover up our sins. You know, Adam and Eve, the very first thing that happens when they have knowledge of the good and evil is they realize that they're naked. And so right away, they want to cover up and they use fig leaves to do that, which probably didn't cover a lot, but it was something. We got to make sure that we aren't in bondage to shame and that we're not just simply trying to cover up because those things tend to to lead us into more sin. We don't want that. Our question for today is, what is important to learn through the consequences of sin? It's important for us to learn through the consequences of sin. Been going through Genesis chapter 3. Uh, most of you, if you have a paper Bible, it should start around page 1, is Genesis 1. And Anyway, if you have trouble finding it, let me know. It's the first book in the Bible. A couple chapters in, but uh, Genesis chapter 3, we're going to start today at verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed, clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and knowing evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. 
So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden, Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. A lot of uh, wonderful things in the passage, but there's a couple of things that I find really interesting about this, and it's simply this. To begin with, the Lord asks Adam, then he goes on to say, Eve, what happened? And Adam immediately did some finger pointing. Do you remember that? He said, hey, it was this woman that you put in here. She took of it and she gave it to me like he hadn't been standing there the whole time. He asked Eve and she goes, well, the serpent, the serpent convinced me do it, to do it. And then the Lord doesn't say anything to the serpent other than to curse him. He doesn't get a chance to answer it. And, and here's the thing I think is really interesting about it. The servant, serpent isn't worthy of giving a response to his actions. You hear what I'm saying? He, he isn't worthy. God knows everything. And God looks and he says, you have, have ruined everything with your lies, with your deceit. So why would he give the serpent another chance to deceive? You see, the problem is, is when you know somebody's lying to you, you don't believe another word they say. You're done. You're just, okay, I'll believe it when I see it. I'll believe it some other time. I'm not going to believe it right now. And now, as God begins to respond to the actions in the garden, we need to remember kind of the idea of blessing and curse. We love to talk about blessing. Woohoo! We normally say, Lord, bless me, and we consider it a little bit rude if you say, Lord, curse that person. Some of you don't. I'm a little worried there. Uh, we, we considered good. Now, I told you from back in the very beginning, when God creates the world, he creates a world that will be a blessing. And then he gives a blessing, which is basically go be fruitful, multiply, multiply and fill the earth. That is the blessing. You're going to be dominion over all of the animals. You're going to walk with them and walk with me. And in all of this, there's no death, there's no pain, there's no issue. That's a pretty good blessing, I would say. I think it's really quite important. And so he's giving this blessing, and the blessing is for every creature. So even this serpent that apparently had the ability to talk has been blessed. Some, sometimes we, we wonder, sometimes we think about this, right? That we would love to be in a world where everything is a blessing and nothing is is painful. It's, it's coming, all right? It's coming. Humankind gets this sort of extra blessing and an extra favor in front of God. This idea of dominion over creation as an image bearer of God. Now, if you understand what an image bearer is, it doesn't necessarily mean that God looks like us. Could mean that God has a figure sort of like our figure. But the most important part of being an image bearer is that we are acting as though God would act over all of creation. You follow what I'm saying? So, bring this to modern day. We're still the image bearers of God. Which means that we still have dominion over creation, but one of our jobs is to look like God to all of creation. Which means to look like God to those who are around us, who are people. Which means loving people even when they don't love you back. It means loving creation, which, which is where sometimes we have a responsibility to be somewhat environmentally sound. Because God has given us dominion over creation. Want a good example? If you have a dog, does your dog think, wow, this, this person who takes care of me is so wonderful. That's what God would want us to have. Not cats. We wouldn't want cats. <laughs> Blessing is a favored status with God. 
Do you follow? Just a simple definition. If you want to say, what is a blessing? A blessing means that God is favoring you. Do you ever get there to the, to the restaurant after church and the spot right next to the door is open and you're like, oh, God is blessing me today. You get inside the restaurant and they put down your food and you, oh, look, it smells good. It looks good. I hope it tastes as good. Again, God has blessed me with this food and we usually pray a blessing over the food, which is basically saying thank you. May this food be good for us. A curse is the opposite of blessing. A curse is when you want the spot right next to the door and you're across the street. We've never experienced the cursing, right? Yeah, yeah. God responds to the serpent with a curse. He says, because of this thing that you have done, cursed are you. Cursed are you. He says, you will be lower than all of the animals, all of the livestock, all of everything else. You will always be on your belly and you will eat dust. Now, there are some scholars who question, does this mean that the serpent initially was able to somehow walk? Heard John MacArthur say he can get this sort of vision of like the little Geico lizard going around talking. I don't know if the serpent had an Australian accent or whatever that is, but... But he's almost got that vision. And I'm not 100% sure that I think that that's the case. But I think what, what the Lord is saying is that you won't ever attain any sort of greatness. This idea of eating dust. Now, dust doesn't have a whole lot of nutritional value. But you're down near the ground and you want to go along, what are you constantly going to be worried about getting into your mouth? Mm -hmm. No question in anyone's mind that one of the things that's going on here is the snake is being humiliated. You think you're so great. You think you are like God. You think that you know what God wants to do. Now let me put you in your place. See, you're going to slither around. You're never going to have what you wish you had. You'll be eating dust. And then there's the lifelong hostility between the woman and the snake. Lifelong hostility between the woman and all of her offspring and the snake and all of its offspring. Now, it doesn't take too long to figure out that this is still true. If you've ever been on the next door Yuma Foothills site, about once, uh, twice a week, somebody has to post how there was a snake in their pool or in their garage or on their back patio. And by the time they've posted it to the site, I'm pretty sure that they've calmed down. But you can tell by the post, they were not thrilled to find a snake anywhere near their home. I think it kind of is like a little tiny mouse that might run across the floor. How is it that such a tiny creature induces such fear? 2001 Gallup survey said that 51% of adults are afraid of snakes. It's the most common fear. Fewer people are fearful of public speaking than are fearful of snakes. And incidentally, this is just totally off the topic. You're welcome. When they did this survey, they'd done one in 1988 that had the same questions on it, and almost every single one of the fear categories had gone down by at least five percentage points. Snakes used to be 56%. Now it's 51. There's one category that went from 1% to 11% in that time period. Any guesses?
46. <laughs> 1 to 11% was dogs. Dogs. Serpent becomes a symbol of the struggle between good and evil. Now think about this. God created humankind. God created everything to be good, to represent good, to, to be God's image bearer to the world. God is good, right? And so you have good represented in human, humankind. And then you have evil represented in the snake. And so the serpent becomes a symbol of this struggle that we will forever be under until Jesus comes back or until we leave the earth, until we return to dust. So the struggle is going to be a long-lasting struggle. Isn't that great news? So happy to be the bearer of wonderful news for you this morning. There's a struggle between good and evil, and until we die or Jesus comes back, you'll be a part of it. Uh, praise God? Yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe not. I tried. There's a moral message that's in the actions of humanity and in the actions of the serpent. There's a moral message there. Now, now here's what I mean by that. It, it says, he will crush your head. Speaking of mankind or humankind, will crush your head. What's the first thing you do if you want to get rid of a snake? Oh, Chop its head off. I ain't here. <laughs> Call rural metro. You go for the head. But God is talking to the serpent here, and he says, you will strike his heel. So where can the serpent go? For your heel, right? You're walking along. All of a sudden, there's a snake you didn't see. Where's he aiming? Going for your heel, but you can crush his head. You have kind of a tactical advantage there. So you have this good versus evil. So there's this moral message within this idea because what it basically says is that you can resist sin. Evil can and should be resisted. It wants to strike, but we have the power to crush it. You're getting there. <laughs> See, if we look at sin and we want to say that there's nothing we can do because that stinking, lying serpent, then we might as well just go sin away. What's the point? Uh, but if what God says here is true, and then when the serpent starts to say, oh, it's really not as bad as you think it is, or that really wouldn't be so bad as you think it might be, or hey, would that really happen if you did that? Would that really separate you from God? Hey, the answer is, is, if God said it, why am I listening to you? What do you do if you want to get away from a snake? Do you reason with it? Do you listen to what it has to say? Oh, I'll be safe. Trust me. Don't worry about that rattling sound you hear. I'm just a little excited. So nice to meet you. What do you think? Well, let's do it. No. No, it's not what we do. Biblical scholars call this particular verse the Proto-Evangelion. Isn't that exciting? Write that down, Proto-Evangelion. You're not writing. It's the first good news. If evangelism is about taking good news from the world, this is the first good news we get. Sin has entered the world, and within a few verses, guess what? There's a message of hope. You don't have to sin. The man and the woman are not cursed. Pay attention when you read the scripture because it says the serpent is cursed. But when he gets to the man and the woman, he doesn't use the word cursed about them. Never. 
But what he says is the beautiful thing you had, eh, it's not going to be so easy anymore. And by the way, the reason it's not so easy is now you know good and evil. So things that are supposed to hurt are going to hurt. Do you ever think about that? God had a way of just saying, yeah, that childbirth thing doesn't have to hurt. If you don't know what it means to hurt, right? So this idea of, of there being a lot of labor is sort of a reminder to Adam and Eve and to the rest of us of, of our disobedience, our, our tendency to sin. Yeah, thanks a lot, Adam and Eve. I want you to think again in terms of blessing and curse. The blessing was given to Adam and Eve to enjoy the world. Right? We've already established that. To fill the earth, which means have lots of children. We're okay with that. That was the blessing that was given. And God does not take it away. In fact, God leaves it in place. The only difference is, is that what was going to be very easy becomes a little more difficult. I don't want to lose you. Pain in childbirth and a desire for her husband leaves Eve's blessing perfectly intact. She's still favored by God despite her disobedience. Y'all don't seem very excited about that. All right. Desire for her husband has been interpreted in a, in a lot of ways. And one of the ways that sort of bothered me is uh, I was reading that it has often been interpreted as so, sort of a desire to stay with a man, even if that man is abusive. And I have a bit of a struggle with that. Because I don't think that God would, would necessarily give us that sort of desire in the, in the realm of blessing. I don't think that's true. I think it would be best to think of this desire as one to continue fulfilling the blessing, to continue having children, even in the midst of the, the pain of childbirth. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say anything. You know what I've said about my imagination. Some of you keep coming back anyway. We're not really told when Adam and Eve have their first child. We're going to get to chapter 4, or you're going to get to chapter 4. I'm not sure if we're going to go there or not. But get to chapter 4, and they have a couple of kids. The kids have a little sibling rivalry going on. Yeah, little. <laughs> all centers on who is more favored by God. It's kind of a fun reason to be upset, but let's say they have a child inside the garden and that is super duper easy. Just no pain, no fuss, no muss. The baby is perfect. You can sleep all night. All those wonderful things. Then you get out of the garden and the first contraction hits. And I don't know what she would have said about Adam's mother. <laughs> but my guess is, is that at that point she'd be like, I think I'm done. Might have been a little more fun back in the garden. Now, this isn't any fun. I don't know. I think that we could look at this desire and to say that even though it hurts, that the blessing will continue because a woman has a desire to carry out God's, what God has asked. Let's put that out. I want to make sure we understand that man's rule over woman is not unhealthy control. God never desires for us to be unequal. Do I need to say it again? God never desires for us to be unequal. 
It's a simple thing, but it's a consequence. It's not a mandate. It's a reminder of the destruction of sin. And it comes down to one really simple fact. Man tends to be a little larger and a little stronger than woman. So when things become unhealthy, one of the things is, is that it becomes where the man seems to be more important or, or more dominant. And that's not what God ever intended. He intended for Eve to be an equal helpmate. Adam's consequence seems greater. Seems like he has a little more work to do. And the reality is, is that he bears a little more responsibility for the disobedience. Adam is standing right there when Eve is talking to the serpent. We've already established that. He's just standing there, not sure what he did. Might have been watching a football game. Talk to a man while the football game's on and forget it. All bets are off. He won't hear a word you're saying. Right, Charles? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody say my name. <laughs> he is standing there and says nothing. But he had heard God say, don't eat from this one tree. Anything in the garden is yours, but, but stay away from this one. And when she goes, ooh, look, this looks tasty, he doesn't go, stop it. Don't you remember what God said? Don't you remember what, what God wanted? It's interesting because Adam's new labor centers around eating. Hmm. You have a little problem. You've sinned against God. The sin was that you ate something. Well, love and logic right here. His disobedience surrounds eating, and so does his consequence. His consequence is that he will now labor in order to eat. Now there's going to be a, a much more difficult thing. The, the life-giving food was without toil before. I don't know if there was even a weed in the garden. Get the impression that there wasn't any. Uh, that when you walk through the garden, everything was perfect. And, and the, the kind of toil that they did in the garden was just enjoying life as God intended. Now God says something that's rather important. Cursed is the ground. You're going to have to work it. You're going to get some thorns and some thistles. Isn't that exciting? Woohoo! Better get you some gloves. Good luck. If you don't work, you don't eat. Now, I want to be careful here. We should recognize work as a good thing. There was obviously a vocation for Adam and Eve in the garden, or they wouldn't need a helpmate. They wouldn't need a companion. There's something going on there. But I think that for the most part, it was just a matter of whatever God wants and being around God and enjoying God. And it gets lonely when God decides he wants to take a break. Not sure. I'm just, I told you about my imagination. But it's important for us to remember that God does not curse man. God curses the ground. Don't let that fall. The work is a reminder that sin destroys good things. In other words, if you have things really good with God right now, guess what? Sin will destroy it. Sin will pull you away from that. God gives them clothes. It says it gave them garments of skin. That would probably be animal skin as opposed to the, the, the little fig leaves. And there's some debate, but I'm going to tell you that I believe that he does this as an act of grace, an act of love. I think initially when they were looking around trying to figure out what is it that we are going to do, they go find some fig leaves, and fig leaves not being very covering. And God says, let me show you what this could look like. Let me show you what you can do. But in the midst of this clothing incident or this clothing scene, 
It resents, represents hope for a future with God. That's exciting stuff right there. A couple of you were nodding. I guess the rest of you said amen inside. God banishes the couple from the garden out of hate. He ha hates them. Just checking to see if you're paying attention. He loves them so much, he says, you can't stay here. Now, wait a minute. Come on. They could just walk up and eat and God walked around in there and everything was perfect and they didn't have to do all the work and all this, but isn't that love? Isn't it like great? You know, here's the thing. If Adam and Eve had been allowed to stay, mankind would have been forever separated from God. Forever. Why? Just keep going back. All right, stay away from this tree. Okay. No, no, stay away from this tree. Okay. God says, I'll nip this right in the bud. You can't come back. Hmm. There's some good news in that as well. Now, we know the end of the Bible. They didn't when Genesis was written, but the end of the Bible talks about some trees that are going to be on the banks and accessible to the residents of the holy city. You understand that's us in heaven, having access to the tree of life. Yeah. I'm worried some of you fell asleep. The person next to you sleeping, will you just... <laughs> All right, we'll try it. Do you have in your mind what heaven looks like? Do you kind of have this vision that anything you ever want is available to you? That God in his wisdom and his presence will, will have everything that you could ever desire right there? that you will never be sick, that you will never have any pain, that you will never be insecure about who you are, and you will never have anything but God's presence to enjoy. Yes. Maybe we need to talk a little bit about heaven. Some of you are looking at me like, huh? <laughs> Check this out, all right? You ready? The Garden of Eden perfection, tree of life. Okay. We're out of it right now. We get to heaven, tree of life, perfection. Can you get excited now? Yes. <laughs> this is great news. Yes, they've been banished, but they get to go back. It's not final, final. It's just final for now. Oh, okay. I'll make you guys stay for some extra credit. <laughs> this point, I, I think the answer to our question is somewhat obvious. The question I asked was, what is important to learn through the consequences of sin? What is important to learn through the consequences of sin? And here's the first one. God still loves and blesses humanity. The best thing I could say here is that we love our children. We love people around us. But inevitably, they will one day sin against you. Your best friend will one day let you down. Your children will one day intentionally disobey you. I know, gasp. <gasps> Y'all did it to your parents. Got some deceivers in here. Bottom line is even though you are still favored by God. Amen. Yeah, yeah, okay, half of you. 
All right, here's the way this works. I'm going to say something really profound, like, you are favored by God. <laughs> and you, as though you're really excited, agree with what I'm saying by saying amen. Some of you, this is going to be really uncomfortable. Are you ready? I'm going to say something really profound. You are favored by God. Amen. I'm still not sure some of you believe it. <laughs> Still not sure some of you believe it. <laughs> the struggle of good and evil isn't eternal. Amen. Isn't eternal. The outcome is known. The serpent's head will be crushed. There's a little bit of a, a prelude to something that might be kind of cool coming up in history. Like, uh, I don't know, somebody defeating sin. That would be cool, wouldn't it? Humanity has the opportunity to sort of return to the garden and live as God intended. Why? Because you are favored by God. You are blessed by God. And He wants to live with you in His presence forever. Amen. You're getting there. One thing I want to make sure we get is that God does banish them from the garden. They're going to get a chance to go back. But redemption is possible here and now. We have this thing called new life, spiritual rebirth, to be able to be in communion with God again. Sin destroys that. That's the death that's in there. And God gives us the gift of restoring it. We do that through Jesus Christ. Are we really living like we believe this? Do you live as though God favors you? Do you look around and see blessings and go, God favors me so much I can't even imagine what would happen if he gave me everything that he would like to give me. Hmm. Mind blown, right? The consequences of sin are actually the beginning of restoration. I think sometimes when we think consequence, we think punishment. When we think punishment, we think lack of forgiveness lack of grace, lack of all of that. But in consequences is the beginning of the restoration process. And by the way, all restoration begins with consequences. If you get bad grades and your parents say you got to wear the, the sign, that's where restoration begins. Why? Why? Because if the punishment is effective or the discipline is effective, it's not punishment. It teaches you. It grows you. It helps you to understand what it is that God wants from you. I wanted to point this out. The kids in the examples we talked about earlier disobeyed on purpose, willfully, even the kid with the bad grades, like I said, no parent goes out and punishes their kid because they're not very wise or not very smart. You just don't. You punish a kid for bad grades when they're not doing the work. Not following the guidelines for using the car. Willful disobedience. Not working on school to achieve good grades. It's willful disobedience. Misusing social media, complaining about parents, throwing late night parties. <laughs> willful disobedience. <laughs> Doing 
the one thing God told you not to do? Yeah. Happens, right? Just an accident. Despite their disobedience, God does not give up on humanity. He's still present in Genesis chapter 4. I kind of alluded to that a little earlier. A little sibling rivalry, and God says directly, directly to Cain. Watch out. You're about to sin. It's crouching at your door. You don't want to do this. And there's some willful disobedience. God doesn't withdraw. He gives consequences and begins restoration. We may not fully know the extent of the ways in which God has given us consequences and how we've grown until God's purposes are fulfilled. And I put a nice big word there if you want to write it down. It's eschatologically. key word that means at the end of things, when God's purposes are all fulfilled, when, when Jesus comes back, essentially. Then it'll suddenly become clear to us. Only then it'll be too late if we want to keep on sinning. We will not have done what we were supposed to do. I want to point out that living a redeemed life now is possible. If we're going to talk about sin and what we believe about sin, we got to talk about the fact that living a redeemed life now is possible, and I'd love to talk to, to you more about that, and if you have questions about that, talk to me afterwards or come back next week. My curiosity is, does your life show evidence of restoration and redemption? Despite any consequences, despite any separation between you and God. In other words, are you blessed? You favored by God? A couple things I want to say real quickly. One is that sometimes we refer to this as the fall. You never see it referred to as the fall in the story. The fall of mankind. There's a couple things. One is falls are generally accidental. You know, oops, I fell. This was a willful act. And the second thing is, is, you don't really get Adam and Eve or the serpent, any of them saying, you know what, God, this is really unfair. We made one little mistake. In fact, all the evidence seems to point out that they just keep on doing what God called them to do, meaning that they were restored and they were blessed. Why don't we live the same way? I fear that sometimes we don't take sin seriously. We don't realize that sometimes we're living in the consequences of our own sin, not that every bad thing that happens to you is because of your sin. That sometimes we're living in a way that we're not really paying attention to what God wants us to do. And when we do that, we give up the blessing. If that's you today, you cannot say yes to this question. You simply can't. Unless you begin to make things right with God. He makes it really easy. Send his son to die that we would be able to do this. All we have to do is say, Lord, we accept you. We want to have this kind of relationship with you. We want to be blessed. If that's you this morning, just talk to God about it while we're praying. Anybody needs to come to the altar, they're open. You can pray at your seat. Whatever position of prayer is most comfortable for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house this morning. We thank you for the fact that in the midst of our errors, in the midst of our willful disobedience towards you, you never give up on us. That there isn't anything that we can do short of just saying, Lord, we hate you and never coming back to you. There's nothing we can do to really fully separate ourselves from who you are. 
Lord, I ask that you'd help us to remember this story, to remember this reality, that while consequences might be real and consequences might have to happen, that ultimately it doesn't mean that it's totally fatal. But what it means is that it's the beginning of restoration. It's the beginning of our opportunity to make things right and to continue to live with you despite the fact that things may not be so easy or so perfect. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for each person gathered here this morning. We thank you for this opportunity to gather. And we thank you for each one to whom you've spoken to. If there's any here this morning, Lord, who haven't yet given their lives completely to you, may this be the moment in which they say, I want Jesus in my life. And I want to be on the road to restoration and nowhere else. We pray all of this in the most wonderful name we know. Be with us as we go about our week. Bring us back safely to worship together once again. All God's people said, amen.